what is ignorance? What is the origin of ignorance? What is the cessation of ignorance? What is the way leading to the cessation of ignorance? The root word of ignorance is to ignore. Okay? Ignore what? Ignore the Four Noble Truths. Not see how they actually work. Now, this is one of the things that is very uh, necessary to have a Buddha come. Because they rediscover the Four Noble Truths and the links of dependent origination. They rediscover it all, all subtleness as well as gross things. So, these religions that they hold to one being as the the ultimate end. There's no such a thing as an ultimate end. And they kind of look down on Buddhism because they say, well, another Buddha is going to come around a little while. <coughs> but that little while can be quite a while. Uh, this Buddha era, we're incredibly lucky because there are six Buddhas that are coming in this span. It might be, <coughs> you can't put time on it, but it might be a hundred thousand years or a million years from now. Who knows when the next Buddha is going to show up. There's a lot of talk about waiting for the next the next Buddha to appear. Okay, the, the next Buddha, his name is Maitreya. He is in the Tusita heaven. <coughs> One day in the Tusita heaven is equivalent to 400 years here. Now, two Buddhas cannot appear in the same Buddha, uh, Buddha era. <coughs> the Dhamma has to completely fade away. And ignorance is a thing that takes over, ignoring how everything works. And it's a very long period of time before another Buddha will appear. There's three kinds of Buddha. Gotama Buddha was called an intelligent Buddha. He was intelligent because it only took him four Mahakapas and a hundred thousand lifetimes to become a Buddha. Mahakapa, well, there's there's four asankayas, okay? There's an expansion of the universe, and that's one asankaya. Now, it, it, numbers are really, this just gives you an idea of the length of the expansion of the universe. The, the, uh, scientists and, and astronomers are talking in billions of years. Like that's some kind of a long time. The expansion of the universe, Wanasankaya, is 10 with 160 zeros behind it. That's how many years it takes to expand. And then the universe stops for an Asankaya. And then it contracts for an asankaya. And then it stops for an asankaya. And then it starts expanding again. <coughs> In the universe, there's 
there are many, many different universes, let's put it that way. The only time there is life on planets is when there is an expansion. So we haven't even begun. I mean, we're, we're just at the start of the expansion right now, I think. Because it's only a few, a few, a few bil billion years old. And it takes a lot longer than that. A billion is uh, 12 zeros. <laughs> and it's going to take 160 of them. <coughs> okay, these four uh, Sankayas make up a Maha. Mahakapa. I couldn't pull it out for some reason. Okay, now this Buddha, it only took him four expansions and contractions of the universe to purify himself before he could be, while he was a bodhisattva, before he could become a Buddha. The next kind of Buddha is called an energetic Buddha. This Buddha, it takes him eight Mahakapas in a hundred thousand lifetimes. When, there, when he's reborn, he's reborn in a period of time when the life expectancy of the human being is quite long. Uh, 50,000 years, 100,000 years, like that. And he only gives a Dhamma talk occasionally. The last kind of Buddha that there is is called a moral Buddha. And they take 16 Mahakapas. When he gives, a, he, he mostly teaches by example and if he gives a Dhamma talk it might be once in a thousand years the life expectancy is very long but time is a weird thing I mean it's all relative now the way you become a Buddha is by seeing a Buddha being very inspired you have to have the potential to become an arahat and you renounce that and you make the determination I want to be a bodhisattva, I want to be a future Buddha. <coughs> That's what bodhisattva means, future Buddha. Now the Buddha when he does it in front of him he will look into the future and tell you whether you have enough determination to do that or not. When you take a bodhisattva vow, it will stop you from attaining Nibbana until you have all of the, the parami, all of the perfections. There's ten of those. I'm not sure I can repeat all of them. Do you know? Energy, uh, truth, yeah. determination. Kanti, patience. Yeah. Yeah. And he he has to perfect all of these different qualities, and it takes quite a long, many lifetimes to do that.
Mel, what's happening right now with people at this time? They're told by Buddhist teachers that they should become a bodhisattva. And they tell them, you become a bodhisattva until, and you renounce Nibbana, until all beings can experience Nibbana. Now, if that was true, we wouldn't be here right now. So there's some wrong thinking about the bodhisattva vow. And when they started becoming real popular with uh, some of the teachings, all of a sudden there were no more arahats around because everybody was taking a bodhisattva vow. So they had to make up an, uh, an idea of what Nibbana was and it gets real confusing. Now, the Theravada and Savastavadins, they don't take the Bodhisattva vow. And that means they have the potential to attain Nibbana and become an Arahat in this lifetime. If you mm, attain even one jhana, you have the potential to experience Nibbana in this lifetime. I have a lot of students that have taken the Bodhisattva vow and I talk with them about it that if you take the Bodhisattva vow what generally happens with people is they take this vow and they might go through 5,000 or even 100,000 lifetimes and then they start realizing how difficult it is and they renounce the vow but they're not in a Buddha area anymore <coughs> so then they start going on the wheel of Zansara and they get lost So I try to encourage people not to take the Bodhisattva vow, or if they have taken it, I encourage them to let it go if they want to attain Nibbana in this lifetime. I've had some students that say, no, I'm fine with this, I'm going to continue. And that's, that's okay. It's their choice. I can't I'm not trying to talk them out of it, I'm just trying to educate them so that they know what they have to look forward to. <coughs> a bodhisattva, there, there are some claims that Jesus was a bodhisattva. Maybe yes, maybe no, who knows? It's a very personal thing. And you know in each of the lifetimes, you know that you're a bodhisattva and you know what you have to work on. It generally happens when you're young, oh, 10 or 12 years old. You will have a very, very vivid dream of a Buddha image. And you enter into the Buddha image. Now, if you enter into the feet, that means you're just beginning. If you enter into the navel, that means you've been doing it for quite a while, but you still got a lot more to go. You enter into the heart, that means you're getting close to being done, only a few more mahakapas. And you enter into the third eye, that means you're getting closer and closer to becoming a, a Buddha. And it is a very, very vivid dream. And that's how you, you kind of judge whether you want to keep going or not, because you start seeing how much suffering you really have to do so that you can perfect all of these different qualities. Now the Buddha was talking about his being a bodhisattva and he said the quality that he never broke 
was the quality of honesty, of always saying the truth. And that's one of the reasons that when he could, when he would give a Dhamma talk, everybody would listen because they had that perfection of the truth. And it affected his voice in such a way that he would talk at this level and you might be uh, <clears throat> at, the, at the mill and you would hear it just as well as you were here. His voice carried like that. It was very amazing. The idea that you're being selfish because you want to attain Nibbana now is completely ridiculous because as you go deeper and you become a Sotapanna and then a Sakadagami and an Anagami, your compassion to help other people becomes very, very strong. And you help a lot of people along the way. So there, it doesn't mean anything when they say, well, you're, you're being selfish because you're not, you don't want to become a future Buddha. And there's all kinds of strange ideas out there. Uh, call me uh, Bob Buddha because that's who I am. No, you're not, not even close. You can't even call, really call yourself a bodhisattva if you have that kind of an attitude. Because they have to go through a lot of trials and tribulations. So people, after 30, 40,000 lifetimes, realizing that's what they're doing, they go, boy, this is hard and they give up the vow. Now, how long do they have to wait before they see another Buddha? It depends on their merit. <clears throat> so, taking a bodhisattva vow is entirely up to you. You can do it or not. I know that there are quite a few Theravada monks that take the vow, but they don't talk about it. It's not talk. It's you have to walk the walk, not talk the walk. But there's a lot of romanticism around being a bodhisattva. And some people, they just want to do it. I said, fine, you can do that. I can take you and show you how to do this meditation up to the realm of neither perception nor non-perception. That's all I can do for anybody. But after that, you will not be able to experience a cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. Because the bodhisattva vow will stop you. <clears throat> 